Welcome everybody to UPA Live. Uh, we're excited to have everybody here today and uh, and especially to have Jay Drowns from UVU Photo to talk to us about baseball and softball photography. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, hand off the reins to Jay and, and love to hear what he's gonna have to say. All right, well, we're gonna keep it sort of informal and I'm just gonna show some photos and try and go through some of what my thoughts are. Um, start with sharing the screen here. I did notice that uh, John Froshauer has joined us. And if any of you don't know John, he, uh, he and I used to string, he still, I think, strings for AP out of Seattle. And he used to pick me up at uh, my in-laws place and drive me to, to the different games because he was just south of, of uh, where my in-laws lived anyway. So good to see John, he's a great shooter. Um, I don't think he puts his stuff in the in the um, mitt contest, but he ought to because he'd, he'd probably be running away with a bunch of stuff. Anyway, so shout out to John. Um, to give you a little bit of my background, I, I didn't necessarily set out to do mostly sports, but my first newspaper gigs, you know, I was the young kid working nights, so I shot mostly sports. Um, from there, I, I you know, ended up being a director of photography at a, a newspaper in uh, Southeast uh, the Southeast uh, Chicago area, actually Northwest Indiana, but we covered Southern Chicago suburbs. Um, and then he called up a friend who was working at the Sporting News at the time and said, hey, I'm coming to Columbia for a, uh, for a um, photo editor's workshop. Would you like to do lunch? And he tells me, hey, uh, before you, I can even finish the sentence, he's like, hey, do you have a portfolio together? Are you interested in a job? Anyway, six weeks later after having visited and going to dinner with all the hiring editors I got a job with Sporting News magazine and spent just under 10 years with Sporting News covering you know division one sports and and uh, and professional sports a lot of baseball um, not so much softball there but um, I've covered plenty with our team here since I've, since I've gotten here so anyway with that uh, bit of background let's talk about uh, baseball and softball um, first of all, I always thought it's softball is sort of a misnomer because if you ever get hit with the softball, it, it's, it's not soft. It, hurt, it, it hurts. Um, you know, with, comparing it to other sports, you know, it's football. Football is sort of a predictive sport. You, you set yourself up. I've always felt like the, a great football photographer would be a great defensive back, right? They, they read the offense. They sort of figure out what may or may not happen. And you, you hedge your bet and put yourself in a good space. Um, some of the sports like uh, the constantly moving sports like hockey, basketball, soccer, you know, if you miss, miss it this time down the field or court there or the ice, you're going to see them again. Um, and really out of those, the only one that might have a, a stoppage that's as long as the slow times in baseball is hockey. And that's when, you know, you get to photograph a couple of Neanderthals punching each other. So there's still something to shoot. Um, oh, and there's, there's also the routine sports like track, gymnastics, you know, it, you get a ch second chance to, to see them doing those things. So it's pretty easy to figure out with baseball and softball. It's sort of the, the hurry up and wait game, hurry up and get yourself in position and hurry up and be ready to sit there and wait for 10 or 15 minutes before any real action happens. Um, what other sports considers a perfect game to be when there's no action on the field other than the ball being thrown directly down to the catcher, you know, no runs, no hits, no errors. That's a perfect game. Um, the other thing that makes them different is the, the amount of time. I don't recall if John was at that game, but I remember covering a game at, in Seattle that ended up going 19 innings or 20 innings. It was like a six hour game. It was one o'clock in the night before the last pitch was thrown and we got to go home. So a lot of different things. And to me, to me, that's just a, you know, an introduction to say that baseball is about finding a way to stay, dare I say, awake, alert, ready during those slow times. So we're going to sort of talk about some of those, talk about that challenge and, and ways that I found to do it. To me, the reason why I love shooting baseball and softball is because of that challenge, the challenge of trying to, to capture in a millisecond the action that's going to tell the story. Um, between then, um, 
you try and try to find other things to shoot that, that can tell side stories or tell a little, a little bit about the culture of baseball. And, and with that in mind, uh, and I tell this to our, our interns and our young shooters, uh, when you go to shoot any sport, don't let it be about the process of the sport. It's not about building a, a widget. It's about the culture of the people around it. So look to your dugout, look to the coaches interacting, look to the bullpen and try and find photos there between the moments of action. Um, and also with the other thing I mentioned to, to people is, you know, photographing sports more than any other thing is, is about muscle memory. You need to, to get yourself ready to, for the game the same way the athletes do. If you show up five minutes before a game, you're, first of all, your cameras might not be set up right. You're not going to be in the mental space and you're not going to be warmed up. So do your best to show up at least an hour before any game. If you're going to do any remotes, if you're going to do any sort of thing before the game, that means go even earlier. For the average game that I would travel to when I was with Sporting News, I would want to be there at least two hours before the game. So I had a half hour to get all, everything set up, then a half hour to sort of scout the area, and then an hour to shoot a bunch of stock photos of the players before the game. Um, stock imagery, that actually brings up another discussion of, about what we're there for. As with the sporting news, and, and again, as a university photography, elite photographer, at least 50% of my job is to make sure that I have good usable images of every player on the field. Because you never know when one player is going to have a breakout game or a break, breakout year. And then the, you're going to have the SID coming to you looking for images. And if you just looked at the, the stats before the season and said, oh, this shortstop's not very good. I'm not going to worry about him. You won't have anything good. So every, uh, every batter gets shot before, you know, from each side of the plate. Every pitcher gets shot at least in two or three different locations so that we have plenty of, of direction and, and lead for the, for the designers to use in cutouts or big display ads. Um, my general philosophy for any baseball game is to start, uh, because I'm sh mostly shoot home games, right? I'll spend the first half hour uh, or first ha half of the first inning behind home plate at least the, at least get warm-ups and then uh one batter from right behind home plate and then i'll step out to one side and shoot from that one side trying to get a uh, my general is to shoot every batter from that side and then move over to the other whether it's first or third will depend on on the the bat, the pitcher that's up and or the batters that, that may be coming up if i have more lefties or righties so it's, it's just a, a matter of figuring out the team and what, which spot is going to be your best, best spot for a good shot. Um, honestly, shooting lefties and righties, you don't necessarily have to be on one side to get the shot of them. Um, you know, Right-handed batters, before the swing, it looks better from, from, uh, from first base side. Their follow-through looks better from, from third base side. Um, uh, thinking about that makes you think about a lot of people want to get bad on ball and, and we may talk a little bit more about that later, but to me, bad on ball is, is not that interesting of a photo. I, I do get it, but to me, the, if I'm trying to get a good shot of the batter, I want to see the bat, the ball just before the hits, it hits the bat or just after. And again, we're just talking about, you know, if I'm grading it, if I'm a teacher and I'm in, in the classroom grading, these these photos are just your C or C plus photos. They're not the ones that are going to get you the A. They're not the ones that are going to get you the recognition. But you still have to put produce them. Still have to to pro provide them for your for your editors. So that's bat on ball. That to me is is a better shot just because you're seeing the potential of where the ball is going to go. Um, with this photo, our, our softball field is surrounded by a black net. There's only a few spots where I get up high and I'm down on the third baseline 
that I can shoot without some sort of net in front of me. So the, the rule of thumb, anytime you're shooting through something is get as close as you can to it, shoot with as long a focal length as you can, with as narrow depth of field as you can, so that you can eliminate that, that net. If you look close, well, it's not showing up in this image as much, but some images like, uh, I think there's one later that you can see the spectral highlight, you can actually see the, the net in it. Um, one thing to, to go out for anybody, if anybody has questions as we're going, make sure and shoot those to the, to the chat um, and Jaren will get those to me. Again, I want this to be more of a discussion. If you have thoughts, if you, if you totally disagree with what I'm saying, jump in. Let me know what your thoughts are, but if you have a question, send that as well. Yeah, Jay, just to jump in, I think that is one of the most important things is just what you just said, getting through a net, you be as close to it as you can, touching it, you know, longer lens, that will minimize the, the pattern that you see. Uh, I, that's a, maybe one of the number one mistakes I see among new photographers of baseball and softball is they don't realize how important that is. You can even, as you get closer to it, Pay attention to where the net is, even if it's out of focus, you'll see a little bit of, of uh, lack of contrast and try to put like in this situation, I would try to make sure the pitcher's face is in between those spots on the net so that, that that's as clear as possible. So look for those things to do um, and be purposeful about the net. If you, if you do leave it in there, have a reason for leaving it in there. And we'll see if you feel those photos later, later on. Um, I taught sp speak about the strategy of trying to, to stay interested in the game, change your lenses up, um, change angles. Like, you know, I've turned the camera horizontal as I'm shooting and trying to do something just a little bit different to, to make an, an image that, that may or may not be, be used, but to me, it's interesting. It keeps me awake, keeps me engaged in the game. Um, I have friends who keep a, a note card with them on a string hooked to their vest or to their harness, and they'll, they'll do a box score, which is basically they'll sit there and write down the pitches, write down when people uh, hit or where they got to. And that helps for captioning any information later, but it also helps you to focus on the game and to figure out what's going on. Um, in terms of figuring out what's going on, spend a few minutes with your sports information director before every game. Go up to them, talk to them, and say, hey, what's going on with this game? This, this isn't just baseball. This is every game. Find out if there's some huge moment there. But you can also find out how good is this team we're going up against. Are they good from the mound? Are they good from the plate? And do they have any potential people that on our score, on our team, that may be going to the bigs? that we want to make sure and get extra images on. So again, just looking for a little different angle from that straight on. Um, every, every ballpark is different. The college ballparks are, are a little more uh, general uh, setup than say Major League Baseball, but the general um, dimensions are right here. So outfield wall, far, furthest distance from a whole plate is 400 feet. So to give you an understanding, that's that's more that that's longer than a football field. So if you're trying to shoot the uh, a player jumping up and grabbing a ball off the field off the outfield wall, you have to have a pretty long lens. A 400 is is a big um, a big crop shooting from say third base or first base, uh, the, there's a lot of room for them to, to travel. So you gotta be ready and that, you know, you never know if the ball is gonna go infield or outfield. Um, so general rule, most places, if you notice down here, you know, they got this little box, that's where the coaches will set up and they can move in and out of there. They get, get to be a problem. But if you move just off the field over here, most fields have a place whether intentional or unintentional, they have a place for, for photographers to set up on both sides, somewhere in here. And so these are your go-to spots to shoot game action. Um, you you want to pay attention to the coach and figure out 
is this a guy that sits at the back or does he sit up front? And can I manage my position so that he's not blocking me? For example, if, if I'm right here and the coach is lining up right here, oops, go back. More than more on more occasions than I want to admit, I've been blocked from second base or even from a dive back to first because the coach is standing there and I didn't pay attention to it until it was too late. And I missed the missed the go-to shot of a player who's leading knife off diving back to first or a player stealing second. Um, let, this is a good opportunity right now to talk about the differences between softball and baseball. Uh, baseball, you're going to need, like I said, 400. 400 is the, the go-to lens for shooting baseball. Uh, one of my favorite setups, if, if the location is conducive, I almost prefer to go with a 600 and a 300 so i can use the 300 for for closer stuff and then uh, jump to that 600 because 600 you can you can still shoot stuff tight at at, at the at second base and the furthest base from you you can get some tight stuff on the on home plate sometimes too tight but you can also hit the outfield but it does get a little bit cumbersome to manage those two big lenses and still grab that millisecond of something happening right in front of you um, switching over to softball honestly the infield you can cover everything you need on the infield with the 70 to 200 if you're right on the edge of the field like we are at the uvu field um, so i'll bring a 300 and a 70 to 200 and jump bounce back and forth between those two lenses because even with the 300 at 250 feet um, i can get a decent shot with the 300 on the outfield wall um, I generally try to, to frame it up so it's shoot, you know, for those long, long shots, shoot horizontal or crop horizontal and leave a little bit of extra of the wall so I'm not losing too much uh, resolution on my image, depending on which camera you're using. Um, so any questions about the setup of the fields? Like I said, uh, the, go ahead. I think that's really, really important that you know, you, you go over the, your lenses and what you're using because it is really, they really are different. Uh, I think maybe, could you explain the importance of having two cameras versus one? I Honestly, I'd rarely have less than three, but having two helps you to make that switch. Like say you're on, on third base and you have, uh, you have a, a shot of, uh, you have somebody rounding and coming from, from second base to third that 7200 is the lens you're going to need to cover third base. It's a slide in at third base. You pull up that 7200 and get them coming right at you. Um, dust flying or, and or on our field, it's the artificial turf. So we got those little rubber pellets flying. But you need that second lens to be able to, to tell the story, let alone to create shots of the atmosphere. I mean, the 7200 makes a nice shot of the mound to home plate in some locations where you can see more of the field um, and, and our spot when you're on first base you can shoot back towards the mound and home plate and get the uh, Mount Timpanogos in the background with with scenes of our our campus there on the edge so it's important to have both it's also important to to have a wide angle because you need to show those scene setters you know a good sunset I mean go ahead well, no, sorry. I, I, I think that's really important where you're explaining that this lens is for this zone of, you know, this lens is for what's happening over on this base. I think that I, I would love for you to explain like any tips you have for making switching quicker, going from camera A to camera B. What do you do to make it so that you can uh, minimize that time of transition? Well, if I'm, uh, if I'm using a harness, like the uh, Black Rapid, Rapid straps, I'll make sure and cinch that the uh, I have it on my right hand side, first of all, because that's, you know, my dominant hand, that's the one. So the, you know, if I'm, I'm here with this, the, with the 400 or the 600, then I tuck that onto my shoulder as I'm pulling up the other lens, but it's, it's cinched up high. So it's going to be up here closer and I can bring it right up as my, the crook of my arm is getting my monopod and the lens is setting up there and I can go right to there. Um, if it's, if I'm using this camera strap, it's I, as much as it is uh, not a great idea. I'll, I'll if I for quick 
quick switches, I'll put it around my neck. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll do, the, do that. If, if I have somebody on second and I know they're coming to three, I'll take it from my shoulder with the camera strap and put it around my neck. And like I said, keep that cinched up. So it's a quick grab instead of grabbing from down towards your belt and bringing it up. Yeah. And you sometimes see photographers just like have a camera like sitting over on the ground away from them. There's just no way they're going to have enough time. You know, ergonomically, nope. you need to have it as super quickly accessible. And then after that, it's just muscle memory. You have to practice. Yeah. And you, you bring up a good point, muscle memory. The, 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 uh, the best way, if you really want to do any sport, the best way to get better at it is to do it more. You know, 10,000 hours in any, any given thing makes you an expert if you're, you know, you're trying to learn and moving forward with it. There's no better place to learn baseball than to go out and photograph Little League. Um, there, there, what was it? Uh, was it that fall of 2020 when we had no fall sports? Um, and maybe I'm admitted, admitting something here I shouldn't, but y Utah kept high school sports going. Mm -hmm. So I went out and, and I actually contacted parents and let them know what I was doing. I was still shooting all of that fall, just shooting prep sports for people, partially to feed my addiction. I'll admit it. I'm, Hi, my name is Jamie Durounds. I'm, I'm a sports addict or a sports photography addict. Um, I was getting my fixed in, but I was also keeping, keeping uh, the, the rig oiled. So I was good at, you know, could continue to do my work. Um, I will talk to young photographers and tell them, if you want to get good, the way I did it was I shot more. I shot games I didn't need to when I was with, at newspapers. I would go out and shoot extra games to make extra money, shoot more, you'll get better. Um, and again, show up early to get warmed up. So you're ready. Um, spend some time figuring out that transition and practice it. And if, it, if there's a hitch in it, figure out what is causing the hitch and get rid of it. Same thing a batter will do. If there's a hitch in their swing, they'll figure out where the hitch or the hole is and they'll, they'll fix their swing so that they can hit, hit all the pitches. Awesome. Is that it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, while we're here on this, on, on these diagrams, would you mind maybe just pointing out both on baseball and softball, some of your favorite positions and what are the best shots or the shots you're looking for from those positions? All right. So uh, again, behind home, home plate is where I'll start for both of them. I'll make sure you get a good shot of the pitcher. And I'll also during warmups, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot the pitcher until I feel like I have a good shot of him. And to give you an idea, the first couple of times a pitcher throws, I'll just hammer it. I'll hammer it and go through their whole motion. Then I'll take a second to look through that and say, okay, well, here's something unique about this pitcher. And so I'll go back and then I'll you know, practice for a couple more pitchers, pitches to get the shot I want from behind home plate. So if there's anything unique, like there was, oh crap, I can't remember the name of the guy. There's a guy with the, that was with the Marlins, I think back in the day and his his kick literally his kick would his leg would be up above his head so if you had could get at a, any lower position you can get a shot where his leg was doing this over his head as he's going through his windup so you want to look for those sort of things with the pitch so that it's not just a guy throwing it's a little bit unique so anyway once i get that guy get a good shot of him during the warm-ups before the inning i'll look to the infield because they're the the guy at home at uh, first split base first baseman is throwing the ball to every other person and they get a little chance to ground and throw it back. That's a perfect opportunity to get a couple of stock images. So shoot pictures of those guys as they're warming up. You can, you know, especially with the 600, you can really isolate them and make some good images. Um, so that's from behind home plate uh, over on third base you get a good shot of your, if, if your catcher is up, if you're on defense, third base is the best spot to shoot the catcher as, um, as he's, as a play is coming in, like a player's coming in to, to do a slide. He'll come in there. Um, it's also a good shot for baseball uh, for stealing second base. You know, they get that, they get a shot, they will slide in and it's good for both teams from, from third because you're getting the horizontal of them as, the player sliding and the the field the fielder is getting the ball and trying to throw back to set it's a first for for a double. Um, if we're over on the other side on first base side, 
you're getting a good shot of that second baseman as he jumps up because they'll, you know, when when they come in and it depends on the league, but when they come in, they the run, base runner might have their cleats up to distract the the player and mean meaner uh, players like a, there was an old guy named Ty Ty Cobb from like 1910 1903 to 1917 I think it is he would intentionally try to dig his metal cleats into the leg of the player so to try and disrupt those sort of things so they'll jump the baseball player will jump up to get over the the runner and you can get that from first base you can get some great shots of them leaping up um and first base if you're if you have a runner coming in the home plate first base is a better side because you can see them from there um, most of your softball like say in our for our softball field i can be anywhere along the baseline it's not until about 10 feet before the corner that we have a wall that comes up about three feet so i could even get right behind and shoot but then In the way your photos so that earlier shot of oops wrong way uh, that is shot from right at the edge of that that wall and if it, when a player's coming in we'll see a, a shot later where a girl is a woman is is diving on home plate from this angle it's a great angle to shoot does that help yeah i think that's great to, to just hear some of those different, uh, you know, what you're looking for from those different positions. And it's not like there's a wrong position or a right position. You can make good photos from all of them. They're just, you you want to hedge your bets and do things a little bit different to, to make sure you get a, a good shot. When do you decide to move from one position to another? Is it you just have a preset like, okay, I'm gonna do a couple innings here, then I'll go to a different angle or? My general rule, especially early in the season, my general rule is I, I'll stay on one side until I've seen every batter mm -hmm. and then I'll move over later. In, and, and that was my role for when I was with sporting news, because like I said, 50% of why I was there was to get stock imagery. So we didn't have to, to pay one of the agencies to use their photos. Um, now it, you, when I get a few games into the season, I'm less worried about that. And I'm more interested in looking at the unique photos. Like for example, uh, Bush Stadium used to have these uh, arcs, the old Bush Stadium, they had these arches that people would walk through in the upper concourse. Later in the game, you would get a cool sh uh, shadow of this repetition of the arc, arch uh, hitting the field. We have a similar situation here where, where there's a strip of light that goes through the, the grandstands. So you can get some cool shots of the, uh, of the pitcher, like this one. You can see how he's He's all darkened out, but I get a little shaft of light just, just hitting his face. So I, I'll make my choices depending on what I'm trying to get from, from there. I'm looking to make interesting images less than trying to tell the story of the game. Awesome. But I still have to tell the story of the game, right? That's great. Let's, let's keep going. All right. So again, uh, ballparks are different. This was just to show uh, the green monster. Uh, that it sits at like 300 feet out as opposed to 350, but the wall is higher. And so players will have to play off from that wall. In fact, you, you, they'll go out there ahead of time, uh, players who are visiting, and they'll have somebody at the baseline hitting balls off from that because they want to be able to anticipate how it will bounce off from there. So it's little idiosyncrasies about the field that you need to be aware of. I can't remember if it's Houston or if it was Anaheim. Their dead, dead, stri their straightaway center had a ramp that went up, which I couldn't imagine chasing a foul ball and have to ramp, run up a ramp that goes from zero to six feet. But anyway, every field has something unique. Look for those unique things and, and figure out how to make a good photo based on the field that you're in. All right. So again, pregame sort of went over some of this but you know be looking for unique photos photos that your designers can use um it might be a little bit interesting for them the, these also you know don't forget the fact that that your players get to use your images 
they get, they'll be able to use them one way or another on their social media. So make images that, that will be interesting to them because that they're, I don't know about you guys at school, but our players, pardon me, I'm getting over a cold. So I still have sort of a scratchy throat. <coughs> our players have, a, a, um, by and large, have a better presence on social media than we do. So make sure you're making images of them that they can, that they will like and that they can use. Um, develop relationships with your coaches. Coaches can get really crusty. They might not want you in, in the dugout. They might not want you on the field. They might not want you anywhere around. You're just a fly there that's bothering them. So get to know them early, uh, introduce yourself, talk to them, make sure you understand what they want and what they need and help them understand what you need and how, how you need to do it. Uh, this is our new coach and he totally gets social media. He gets the need for photography and he's willing to let us do pretty much whatever we want other than walk on the field during the game. Uh, build that relationship with the players. The players can let you know when stuff, stuff may or may not be going on. They can, you know, give you good chances to, to make a portrait like this, or they can make your life miserable by during a promotional shoot, not, you know, being standoffish and not wanting to have their photo taken. So uh, there's always reaction. Once the, the last strike happens, that's not the end of it. There's always something else that's gonna happen. So look to make a reaction photo. Sometimes those are the storytelling image. You know, new player getting mad at a new coach. Um, I, on, this is on our third base side. Uh, best spot to, to stand is right next to the dugout. Every time somebody does something good, they come in and you get a little bit of reaction that'll play well on your website or wherever you're sending your photos. Again, reaction. Every home run, you're gonna get multiple options um, to photograph a foot, good photo of, of the guy who hit a good home run. And I'll be honest, I, I, uh, this is probably as good a time to any to explain that, uh, my, <coughs> sorry. I, uh, <coughs> I rely too much on, I have relied too much on my heart, my CDs in the past, my DVDs in the past. So all of my, in preparing for this presentation, I went back to a bunch of DVDs expecting to get images and those DVDs aren't working anymore. So I have a ton of images that I, I you know, love, but I just, I have no access to them now. So take care of your archive, whether it's personal or work, take care of your archive. Make sure you have backups and make sure you have a cloud, cloud option, my opinion. Uh, I say this because I have one uh, shot of a uh, Albert Pujols uh, home run where the pitcher is looking totally dejected on the mound. And I have a shot of him, a, a series of shots, him going around first base with the pitcher in focus in the foreground with his head down. And he looks like he just, you know, lost his dog. And then pictures of him on the other side celebrating as he comes back in. So look for these juxtapositions where you can see the celebration going on. That, that's a better story photo than any of the guys on at bat. To me, it's more it's more interesting than seeing the actual photo of poo holes or you know name your big big hitter hitting the ball. It's more interesting to me than than bat on ball to to get these sort of reaction photos. Do I have more any more questions coming in? Yeah, and if you guys have any questions, please throw them in the chat. Um, I, I think there's just a lot of good comments, but um, I, I do I do love what you said about you don't stop shooting until the, the, the reaction is over, not the play is over. And that's, yeah. boy, I, in baseball especially, so much of what baseball photography is emotion. How are you getting that emotion? Yeah, you, it's, it's a matter of just watching and, and paying attention to what's what's happening it also helps to know you know which players emote and which ones don't some players the world could be falling down around them and they are just going to walk calmly and coolly through their life and not react others you know they get a 
a, a hangnail and they're going to freak out about it. So pay attention to those. Um, this is an example where you got to pay attention to that net and make sure that the net is not blocking the important parts. I don't know about you guys, but we've uh, we've been asked by the WAC and by our SIDs to shoot the opposing team as well. Um, this was uh, Utah, or I mean, forgive me, Seattle wrecked our softball team in uh, one of one of the two games that we played them, and this is a grand slam home run. Um, that actually brings up an issue with the Mick that I have. That, that I don't know about you guys, but there was a change where they they uh, changed it from anything any event you shot could be put in for sports competition to right now. I believe it, it reads that it has to be a photo of your players. So even though I was at the at this event for our team and photographed our team, if even if this was the best sports photo in the world, I could never enter it in the Mick because it's not. A photo of our team. So here are a few reaction photos that I did pick up from from an old hard drive. They're all like at 600k wide. Um, oh, this photo. Uh, this was early early digital. So I'm on that first Canon uh, uh, 1D. So the buffer was like two frames i don't know what it was it was a pretty small buffer and my card was really slow it was the old uh, uh ibm hard drive ones that had a spinning hard drive in there um the i i'm there to shoot stock right and as the uh as the batter hits the ball i get a, and it was uh burley the the catcher for the white Sox. he hits a home run and so I get shots of him as he's swinging, a few shots of he's as he's running. Then I make the shot of Burley on the other side of the field with the the pitcher in the foreground, and then he comes in the home home. Oh no, it wasn't a home run. Sorry. Anyway, he comes in and slides at home. Burley does the other catcher, and as he gets there, he slaps the plate. Well, I have a shot of him as he slaps the plate, but because I shot so many images, my buffer was full. And as this fight broke out between the two catchers there was like 20 or 30 frames that I should have been able to get that I didn't because I wasn't paying attention to my equipment. We may not have this issue now with the, our buffers and the big fast cards, but still pay attention to your equipment, what the capabilities are so that you don't find yourself cursing yourself out because you overshot your buff buffer and you're missing, missing great moments. All right. Any other questions right now? Uh, just one. Uh, so Chelsea, on your comment about hard drives uh, biting the dust or, or our store archive, do you have any um, cloud archival storage that you recommend or have you used for personal work? Um, we use Photo Shelter here for our, our uh, um, for the deliverables. Um, I've always I, that's what I've used for my personal deliverables. I currently don't have a personal cloud for for stuff, but I'm not doing a lot of freelance right now. Um, trying to think of we just switched from the uh, from Box here on campus. We're switching to to I think it's called SharePoint. It's the Microsoft. Yeah. Our our university president used to be the CEO of of Asia for Microsoft. So we do everything Microsoft now, except for our, our computers. <clears throat> so here's that dive in at home plate. Um, you gotta be ready for, for moments. This is a pretty tight shot with that 400. Get used to playing around with the 400 because something will happen on the base in front of you. And you got to be ready to make the make the shot. So this the the player hit the ball, the runner hit the ball, which is an interference call anyway. And I don't know what she's doing right here. It was sort of awkward. It was like she's trying to block the the player, the soft the the shortstop from getting to the ball. Oh, and all these just all these images are from this year's 
softball and and baseball. So that's that's third base lining up on third base, waiting for the guy to to steal. And this is the uh, in baseball they'll some catchers and this is a, a part of knowing your catcher. We had a uh, we have a catcher that can make a good throw back to, to first. He was after the pitch. He sent a sign to his his player, at least as I'm assuming he sent a sign to his first baseman, saying he was going to throw back because this uh, this BYU Cougar thought he was cool, and was leading way off, and had the player held on to the ball. He, he uh, I believe this player would have been been out, but they they'll they'll take the pitch and immediately throw back to first, and knowing that he can make that throw, and si seeing this guy lead off. I had already lined up for this photo when it happened. All right, so next part is, is to hedge your bets, use remotes. Um, I use the Pocket Wizard Multimaxes and we have some of the Pocket Wizard 3s uh, as, as triggers. But uh, you know, if you have questions about those, let me know and we can talk more about it. But this is the basic setup that I'll take. You know, the centerpiece there is called a variable friction arm. Uh, some people call it a magic arm, but technically it's not a magic arm. The magic arm has a lever instead of that uh, twist knob that just does like a quarter move. And those, they don't stay tight. You know, I would never buy one of those for, for supporting the camera. Um, whereas this twist arm, you can tighten that down pretty tight you don't want to overdo it because then you'll pop the bearings that are inside, but you can get a pretty good uh, position. I'll use these for remotes on the backboards when I'm, for basketball, but uh, you set up remotes um, on either side of home plate and you can, uh, oh, and I forgot to bring it in. There's a uh, foot switch that I use. I was going to bring it in and show you it on the video, but it's out of my desk. It's the foot switch I use is a foot switch for an old, dark room and larger and it's basically just got a, a mini mono plug on the other end that just comes out and goes right into into the remote so i can eat i instead of putting my remote on my camera if i'm in one spot for any length of time i just put it on the on the ground and i can be working my with, with my hand and then just hammering the, the remote from the, the pedal switch um this piece down here if you want to use a ball head, that this piece fits nicely into the super clamp, and then you can clamp the your your uh, remote onto the your camera onto here with it's under the ball head. Sorry, losing my mind here. Any uh, any other questions about remotes? No, maybe just uh, my <clears throat> excuse me. My question is: is what are your top two places for the highest percentage of great shots with remotes? All right, um, I'm a, I'm, I almost always have it on home plate just because that's the important things are gonna happen there. Um, and usually high up, as you can see, uh, the majority of these are from uh, an observation of looking down. That way the, uh, the official doesn't have as much of an opportunity to get in the way. Um, again, with the trust your, don't trust your hard drives, these are all, from Getty images, just screenshots because it's the only place I get, could find these images. Uh, the lower center one of Everett, he, uh, I'm trying to remember if there was, if I remember right, he, there was something about his, his on base percentage or something that they wanted an image of. And so that I shut, set up that shot with the remote because I needed to be in another spot and uh, was able to make that shot. Um, our current location, there's uh, spots on both dugouts where I can shoot back towards home, and it's an 80, it's a 70 to 200. Uh, I focus if, uh, with the current spot. I, I will, uh, it's shooting from the side back towards home plate, and I'll, I'll just do a zone focus. So the outer edge of the focus is right out here, and it comes into, into the inside of the plate. So does that help? 
And then Clay was asking these these remote shots you're using the Pocket Wizard, they're not a hard wire then. Correct. So your trigger is going to a Pocket Wizard, which is sending a signal to all your remotes. Yeah, and there are, there have been some places like with bigger games, there's more radio frequencies. Um, I have done hard remotes uh, or hard line, but uh, a, a relay sometimes is necessary. You you'll set up one of your pocket wizards in between where you are and the remote your remotes so that it will relay the signal. Good. Have you ever tried a, a remote from outfield into onto home plate? It's from John. I have not, haven't been able to, haven't had the need for that or had the right lenses for that. No, if I got honestly, the, yeah, the 800, the, I was just gonna say that the 800 from center field back to home plate would be, would be perfect. But I think you'd probably, I don't know, I, and I've never done this, but you might have to do a double relay on that to make that work. Yeah. All right. So I believe that was the end of that, uh, of the images I have. Do we have any specific questions outside of that? Yeah, guys, now that, now that you're the end, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, or if you want to put it in the chat, we'll, we'll ask it of Jay. Uh, from Dean, do your SIDs run photos of key moments of the game, even if your team lost, or do they just run the best photos, uh, depending on, you know, is it, is it statistical or is it just best photos? What do you think? Um, our, our SIDs are a little, I don't know, the, yes and no. I mean, sometimes it's the best image. Sometimes it's just a player they like. Uh, we, we don't really have a set pattern for what they do. Uh, they won't, our SIDs won't ever run the shot of uh, the best shot of the game if our team loses. They're, they're all, always about promoting their, uh, promoting our, our, our players. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, let's see, David was asking if you've ever been hit by the ball. I have, I was actually in Seattle and, uh, a foul ball, uh, I think it was Buner, hit a uh, foul ball that came into the front of, of the photo well. I was towards the back of the photo well. And because it was coming in over there, I didn't even think about it. It hit the concrete wall right behind me and bounced back off and popped me right in the back of the head. Um, luckily, I think, I think, well, if you ask my wife, I have a hard head, but... Um, the I think most of the speed came off from off from that the back of the wall and it it woke me up but it didn't I didn't get hurt. I, I know there's some places where it's recommended where you wear a batting helmet, uh, especially if you're really close and and we yeah. have a batting helmet for our students, especially on on our field spot, because uh, yeah that's something if you're not when you're in your lens you're not going to see you know maybe you're you're focused on something in the outfield you're not seeing the ball, uh, you definitely want to be safe because you get hit in the head boy that's that's yep. You're gonna have a rough go of it. Uh, John Froshauer could probably tell this story better than I could, but Dean Rutz uh, uh, from the Seattle Times, he was, I believe it was a pregame foul ball that popped him in the head and it he put was, him- He was outside of the, outside of the field too. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah, it went up and yeah. over. And it put him in the hospital for two weeks. Yeah, I mean, was... yeah, something like that. And he had a pretty long time getting back. He was, he, uh, Dean was out for about nine months. And one of the first sporting events yeah. he shot was uh, a football game at WSU. And that's when the AP stringer at the time, uh, I was working for the local newspaper, but he told me, yeah, he, it's his first time back. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was out yeah, he... for quite a while. So if you're in Seattle now, you'll see there's there's a, a small handful of, of shooters who wear wear helmets. Um, I Rod, I think Rod Marr started wearing a helmet like the next day. And Jenny, and he's been, yeah. Jenny did as well. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, you have, do have to be aware of what's going on with the ball. Um, I've seen it. Uh, John Beaver from Sports Illustrated, he was uh, right next to me, and a foul ball. He had his pocket wizard in his hot shoe, and a foul ball came through and knocked the pocket wizard off, and the pocket wizard landed in, in my lap. And had that been, you know, had it curved down just a little bit, it could have hit me in the head, and I wouldn't even wouldn't even known it was coming. Yeah, the, the so closer yeah, to the ball, the, the safer you need to be. You need to, and if you're not behind a net, definitely it's something to think about. So on yeah. that, um, something I noticed <clears throat> in Seattle when uh, Ichiro was here, Japanese photographers would be there. They were frequently the ones hit because, you know, you'd have batters. They've got their lenses on right field. Mm. They're looking yeah. at right field. You know, ball gets hit, goes into the well, whack. You know, yeah. got to watch the, <laughs> got to be cognizant of what, who's hitting and where they're hitting them all the time. So this last set of photos was from, uh, from our field. Our, um, it was the high school championships was, was here on campus and our, our facilities people wanted shots of this. So that's, this was an opportunity to go, you know, practice and have some fun at the same time. But, you know, I bet there's not a single one of you that aren't within a few miles of a high school. And if you wanted to go shoot high school ball, just call them up, tell them what you're doing. I'm sure they'll let you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, that's, that's awesome. This is great information. I think, especially anybody that's new to baseball or softball or wants to improve, I think you give them a lot of great information to work on. So uh, thank you so much, Jay, and thank you everybody for being here. And uh, we hope to see you guys next month at another UPAA Live.